Right. We've got a new little Peggy in the trap. This time a different place, uh, actually a family place. Um, so we're trying to figure out where they come from on, uh, in this area. Uh, we had quite a few hawks come in, um, actually right around Christmas. I think it was actually Christmas Eve. Uh, I went out that evening because I heard that we had some damage on this property and um, uh, I didn't think we had that many hogs but we put some corn down, put some molasses down and that same night we saw just 10 hogs on top of the corn and then uh, about 20 hogs, hogs probably along the fence line. Yeah, that was unexpected to say the least. Uh, so now we have the trap out here, we have to figure out how to make this trap work. Uh, so far we trapped uh, some non-target species, which would be a deer, and then we had cows and horses mess with that trap. So we had to figure out how to secure that trap right, um, figure out the uh, little uh, mechanism down here and make sure that the deer don't uh, trip that as much. And uh, we had one smaller pig in there, now another one. He is maybe slightly bigger than the last one, um, but should be big enough uh, for the, uh, uh, the GPS tracker. Now this one, uh, instead of using those LiPo battery cells, um, we have now 18650 batteries in here. I also replaced the antenna on that thing, so I uh, took the original tracker out of the housing, put it in here, put another uh, bigger LTE antenna on it, so hopefully uh, that uh, also means we have a better signal and don't have as many, um, uh, I guess, signal losses. But uh, I made this a little smaller now. I have to see if this is uh, small enough or I have to adjust it. I'm gonna grab this little dude, it's a little boar, pull him out and uh, put his track on and hopefully we get some data and uh, soon enough find out where these these pigs travel out here and then do something about that. So let's get to it. I need my gloves. Dude, come here. You want me to hold that door for you? Uh, I think I'm good for now. Can you get in? He was ready? Yeah. <coughs> here he is right here. Let's hope it stays on. Ready? Sit. Let her loose. Let's go! Hey buddy, piggy. Piggy? Not that fast. Can I stop? Daddy. Can I stop? He's not that fast. He's not that fast. I'll take collar on. I don't know how fast he is. Can I go a little closer? You want to go after him? Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, is it fun? Is it fun? <laughs> yeah, he should have been like double the size.
so we trapped and tagged this pig right down here. Trap is in this little corner of the trees. Uh, took him over here to get the collar on. And you can see he basically took a straight line. Uh, and that is straight because there's, uh, let's turn the heat map on. You can see there's data points, last one right here. And then the next point is a straight line over here. And that is for the reason that there was no ping in between these two data points. This could be because of how quickly he went over there. You guys saw that the pig basically ran straight in that direction. Or it could be that there was no uh, cell signal in between. It wasn't able to, to submit any more data points. And that's something I did discover. You can see it here quite a bit in this area. So whenever you have this, this um, uh, struck line or dotted line, there's no cell signal. Basically, you lose a bit of data between two, two points. Uh, that's how it's being visualized. Now, I don't know if the LTE antenna or the, the bigger antenna I put on that on the tracker made a difference or not. I did notice that uh, over the period of, of tracking this hawk, I had uh, multiple situations where I lost a signal. But overall, I think the data was still pretty good. Between the two dates, we got 16 days of data back. So after tracking and then to the last data point submitted uh, before the battery ran, ran out, at 16 days of data. Again, this tracker now a little different than the last one. We have three 18650 batteries uh, connected to it. And uh, I felt like it did pretty good. Uh, we had some low temperatures, uh, so the battery did uh, get exposed to lower temperatures, but overall it was fine. Towards the end, once the battery, I think, lost its, uh, its power and the voltage dropped, I did have quite a bit of uh, outages in terms of multiple hours without any signal, any data point. And uh, then the, the app would tell me repeatedly that my uh, tracker is out of battery. So I couldn't really quite tell like when is the time to go after it. And when I did try to go after it, uh, unfortunately it wasn't successful. Uh, you guys can see here this property is fairly narrow. so. Um, and they just travel travel through. So yeah, there's a trap back here, but otherwise they, they mostly just travel through. So we don't have a, the big opportunity to, to get after them. Now, neighboring property over here, this would have been pretty interesting. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make contact. I attempted a few times, but I never heard anything back. But let's, let's look at this data, right? So um, what I learned, and before we dive any deeper, what I learned from this data, and I'm gonna show you here maybe the full spectrum right here. So that's all the data we get back, right? This is in the Bastrop uh, Smithville area. Um, you can see lots of lines in here where there has been uh, no signal. And that's something I've discovered too, just with my phone. So the cell signal out there in that area is not, is not great. But uh, nevertheless, uh, 16 days worth of data right here. You can see that I mapped multiple bedding areas. Those are the, the areas circled in red with a little house in the middle. That is what I would consider a bedding area. I determined that based on the fact that the, the pig went in here and stayed there for multiple hours, uh, sometimes the whole day. And you can see that there's a concentration of, of data points. Um, again, if I turn the heat map on, uh, you can see that even more, more so. Maybe if you turn this off, um, yeah, I mean, you have other heat maps, but this is basically, those are feeding areas. So if I could in this in this particular software, which is tractive.com, I would love to be able to actually define multiple uh, uh, geofencing zones, basically. Unfortunately, I'm limited to, to five. So you can see one, two, three, four, and five. That's all I can create. I would like to be able to create more, but um, I guess the software wasn't written for tracking feral hawks, so it's all good. Anyways, five uh, bedding area. So back to what we've learned from this data. What I learned is that these hogs have multiple, not only multiple, but way more bedding areas than I anticipated. They basically have a little home close to wherever they are at a given day. 
and that's where they bet down. So um, how does it apply to, to your scenarios? How does it apply to hawk hunting? Well, remember those times when you go out and you almost sh you're almost sure you would see something that night and then nothing shows up. That is, I think, explained by what we're seeing here. So you go out, you, you had them over the, on the feeder for the last few days and all of a sudden nothing shows up. Well, that's because they're probably like a mile or two miles over on a different property and they stayed on that property during the day let's say for example over here in this bedding area and then they go out in in a uh, uh, area next next to it or close by where they're actually feeding in this case here's a farm field so they're feeding over here and they might go back to that bedding area that night so you won't be able to see him come out and you are left with uh, um, basically no explanation where they are why are they not showing up so this is this is that i believe this is uh, if I turn all this off, those are the different bedding areas um, where they just feel comfortable, rest for the day, and then uh, go out at night to feed. Feeding areas, uh, you know, with the uh, satellite image below, you can see right here, definitely the farm field. You can see they have been uh, going over here quite a bit, a few data points in here. It seems like they traveled through. But then uh, on the data, I could tell that uh, they've been up here in this area, pretty close to this road quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, this field definitely has been rooted up quite a bit. Also down here, lots of activity in these areas. And then um, same thing over here. And in between, it's just uh, it's a lot of traveling. Let's go to a smaller data set. So this is um, limited to what four days. So the first weekend, and in this first weekend, straight to the bedding area. I believe they've been doing. Uh, this would be feeding. I'm guessing over here. Let's uh, just use that little slider down here for time. So right here, this is about 8 a.m., 6 a.m., and then 8 a.m. That's the next day. Uh, they've been traveling around here in the morning in that covered area. So I don't know if it's feeding or not or what they're doing here. Uh, it's basically during the day here, and then we get in the afternoon somewhere right here. So that's, there's a jump in here from 9.22 a.m. to... 3 30 p.m so now we have some activity in the afternoon and when the big let's say the quote unquote big movement starts that is 10 53 p.m so 11 p.m and all of a sudden they get, go on the trip this area i would say that's also feeding and then they make a jump here after midnight, cross these properties and go over here. Also more feeding in this area. Cross the next property, middle of the night, 3 a.m. Uh, and we'll find out whether they stay. Did they, say, did they go back to the other side or did they stay in another bedding area? We'll find out here in a little bit. 6 a.m. And 7 a.m. Yeah, there we go. So now they go. 8 8 8 a.m uh the next day and they're staying in this bedding area so they did not go back would not cross the property where uh, this pig got trapped on and just stay over there all the way to 6 50 p.m so almost 7 p.m moving out uh, right about 7 30 p.m it looks like and then uh yeah early evening uh feeding this field over here uh, moving down here, 1 a.m., close to the river down here, all kinds of activity. So, yeah, uh, from a from a time perspective, uh, yes, if you would do some data science on top of the data we we, we uh, uh, recovered, uh, you might be able to see them some pattern that you know at certain times they start start moving more. Um, that would be interesting to collect uh, some more data still, some more data sets, and then get this data an analyzed. 
uh, but just looking at one data set like this and then multiple days, there's not a bit specific pattern to be recognized. Uh, I think we would, you know, would need more data sets like I mentioned and from a statistics point of view, you could probably define some pattern, but uh, otherwise it's, uh, it's fairly random looking at these, uh, the history of these different pigs and uh, trying to see when they start moving. Now the interesting part, and it's the first time I've seen that, um, I, I, I thought this might happen. Um, so I was kind of excited when it did happen. So a few days later after we trapped it, these pigs actually did uh, actually did uh, cross the river. So the river was fairly low, um, but not low enough for them to just walk through. So I, I believe they had to swim through. Um, this side is rather steep. Uh, it's more like the cliff, the cliff side. This side over here, um, not as steep, uh, so they can you know, uh, just move up to the river bank, but yeah, here is quite a quite a bit of a drop. So they crossed the river here, uh, and then over here, on the other side, though, I didn't spend a lot of time over here. It was literally just used for travel. Uh, I think there's not a lot of data points in between. I think there's one right here, and then the next one up here. Traveled through here and then crossed again. So that is kind of strange. Um, that's a lot of effort just to travel back uh, crossing that river here, but yeah, they did that. So it wasn't, uh, it doesn't look like it was for the sake of uh, finding food over here. It was really just to uh, get from one side to the other. And then uh, what I believe is probably back to, yeah, back to the to bedding area up here. The rest of the data kind of like follows the same pattern. So you have pigs staying in different bedding areas or most of the day, uh, then moving out in the evenings, uh, moving out to feed, uh, and then go back to a bedding area. But that's the, that's the important piece here, a bedding area, not the bedding area, but a bedding area. So um, I think I could have defined actually at least two more bedding areas uh, in this data set. But like I mentioned, tractive.com limits it to five um, but yeah, uh, that is not a big stretch here. I think that's like a radius of maybe two miles, I would th say. Small area and multiple bedding areas. So imagine, uh, you know, and the places you guys hunt on, there is definitely uh, more areas where they're bedding down. So this gives you maybe some idea, maybe some motivation to go out and actually go through the underbrush because ultimately that's what, what these areas are. Um, if I remove all the, the, all the tracing, uh, underbrush right here, underbrush, wooded, more wooded areas over here. So those are the areas you want to look at, uh, any, any type of area where they get some cover, it could be really close to, to a field. And that's what I discovered in other, other data sets too. It doesn't have to be thick and deep woods, even like here, right? There's a house ultimately uh, um, only within a few hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards, if even. And um, so it doesn't have to be really thick and deep wooded areas. Um, it could be any type of... Uh, of um, brush but i think what is important is that there's a food source nearby so uh, i think this is the prime example over here you have a big field uh, what is considered a food source you can see they're going out here and then just find a, a place nearby it's convenient uh, in and out quick and uh, they they get to sleep and eat so yeah, a uh, few days in, I think it was like a week after we, we tagged it, um, maybe 10 days, I decided I need to go after this pig and figure out, can I can I get this tracker back? As you guys can see, my window of opportunity on this property is rather narrow, um, but I tried my best. Um, I was at the point where the tracker didn't give me a lot of data back. Actually, um, it was cutting out quite a bit. The app showed me you know, out of battery and so forth. So I thought after this night, the tracker will be probably dead. It turned out to be, you know, after day 10 or 11 here that I had uh, about five more days to go. So 
uh, even though the, the data didn't come back as frequent and was, was rather spotty, I still got data back for another five days, which was more than I expected. Anyways, I needed to get after this pig, so I gave it a shot that night. I had this hawk now out here for nine days, ten days, something like that. I need to get on autumn tonight. Um, they just use this as a uh, gateway property, so they only cut through briefly. It's not that, that big out here. Um, so I'm going to try to see if I can get this pig tonight. Um, because I think the battery is pretty much dead. I think maybe if we get this night out of it, but that's, that's it. Uh, after tonight, I think the battery is just going to be done. This is at the end of January and it's starting to get cooler. You can see there's already some fog rolling in. Having the river really close to this property, uh, now we have condensation from the river uh, creating a, a pretty significant fog. I'm sitting and just watching the phone and seeing if the pig uh, would start moving. And it took quite a long time, uh, a lot of fog. Pretty difficult situation for Thermo. So the other night, uh, didn't see any pigs coming in. I stayed until 1 a.m. I believe. Uh, tons of fog. I mean, I was just wet top to bottom. Uh, all the equipment was wet. Uh, K&M cameras, rifles. Uh, there was some some crazy fog, and it came in from the Colorado River. So once the temperature dropped, uh, the river is a little warmer. That fog came in. Um, that was pretty tough. But uh, it was interesting to see how the thermal actually. Uh, penetrates that fog. I mean, I could still see uh, through it as long as it didn't get too thick. Once it got too thick, there's no way for that thermal to get through. Even that thermal on top of the uh, KM, which seemed to be doing a little better with that fog, I, I felt like that was actually able to penetrate a little better than the Thor form must say. But once that fog was too thick, I mean, literally, I just couldn't see another 40 yards or so. Both thermals basically were dead in the water. I packed up at 1 a.m. I tried. Uh, I just wanted to see if, if I can get on this pig before the battery completely dies, but unfortunately it wasn't. Next day I wake up at 7 a.m. or something and uh, I checked the app and saw that the pigs have crossed. So sometime during the night the pigs crossed the property, which is um, probably about 170, 180 yards wide. So it's not a not a very wide a uh, piece of property, so it's uh, you're somewhat limited in your shooting directions and so forth. Um, but yeah, they came through, and then I checked the spy point camera, which I have set up in the fence, uh, looking at the corner head down. All well, these pigs came in right about 7 a.m. Probably right when I woke up, these pigs were on that corn. It was still some somewhat foggy, but I saw the same group. I'm sure the pig was in there. A few days later, uh, pigs come in to the to the trap again. And the, the bigger sow, I think she's the lead sow of this little group, she went in the trap, but she didn't trigger that, that little uh, trigger mechanism, didn't push that lever with her uh, snout, so the, the trap door never um, shut, and she went back out, which is not a big deal. I mean, ultimately she knows now she can go in this trap and can get back out without anything happening, so hopefully, you know, in the next few weeks, um, either the sow or another pig goes in. I know from ultimate night vision, because uh, those guys have been trying the same experiment, they caught a much bigger sow and put a you know, tracker on it. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have uh, good cell signal in that area and they didn't get any data back. Um, but they still managed to put that tracker on this pig. And a few days later, uh, I get another message from the guys from ultimate night vision and they show me a picture of the same sow in the same trap. So, you know, there's this whole idea like these pigs are really smart and uh, I still believe they are smart. Maybe that saw wasn't as smart. I mean, she went back in the same trap, got trapped again. Uh, so they actually managed to get the tracker back, uh, but ultimately they didn't get any data out of it. Um, but yeah, so maybe we get lucky and this pig uh, goes in there. We are now about 15, 16 days after I deployed this pig. In the last six or so days, the battery level 
in the app shot like zero percent if it goes back up to ten percent drops back to zero i mean it goes all over the place and i think that also affected the um the data submission because i have some stretches where there's no data coming back and then all of a sudden the next day next morning uh, the pig shows up at a different location so the next idea here is we're going to double up these 10,000 uh, lipo batteries so put two 10,000 milliampere batteries in it um, i wired something up using uh, what's called Vago or Vago uh, um, uh, connectors. I believe they're from Germany, not really sure, but those are some legit connectors. You can wire something up and uh, put these batteries in parallel. But I also had somebody, one of our viewers actually, Doug, uh, Doug sent me or is sending me um, a, a two um, little circuit boards he made, which uh, actually allow you just to plug in these batteries and then you have a parallel um, battery uh, um, hookup. So that's pretty neat. I'm going to try this uh, next two ten thousands. Uh, just got to make sure we have an area where we have good cell signal, um, because that's probably the biggest factor in draining these. Anyways, let's get to why I'm here, why I'm wearing this stuff right now in my pretty silencer shop T-shirt. Um, rugged. I'm, I'm a believer, and I, I like rugged suppressors. I've been shooting this um, rugged Radiant 762 on my Rome Red River Ultralight for quite a bit. Uh, it's an AR-10, you know, shooting 308. This rifle comes out of the box naked at 5.6 pounds. Uh, fantastic shooting rifle, extremely light, super happy with it. Radiant has been a perfect match for this rifle because it's also very lightweight. Um, you can take this first component off here and then you have this, this uh, part in the back uh, left, so you only have this, this length here. Um, now I have the Rugged Radiant, I have the Rugged Razor. I have two obsidians, a 45 and a 9. Um, uh, what I was missing is, and it's an older suppressor, but I kind of wasn't interested in getting it, the Rugged Micro 30. So this is the Micro 30 right now in the short configuration. This is also one which uh, comes in, uh, which is a modular suppressor. You can take the first module off. Um, just so right now is the shorter configuration. I'm gonna put the specs down below here, but uh, I don't have them top of my head because dead brain. But um, it's a good can, a little heavier definitely than the uh, the Radiant. Um, very uh, comparable to the Rugged Razor. And I just wanted to see you now on that on that um, Rome Red River, shooting the Radiant and shooting the Micro sound-wise, how does that compare? Now on the microphone, the camera, you guys really won't notice. I mean, I've done some videos, suppressors, and to me, every shot, when I cut these videos, every shot sounds the same. Like the, those microphones just can't pick it up. Even after talking to silencer shop, I think you would have to invest like several thousand dollars to get a, a professional microphone which, which actually can cover these, uh, these decibel and uh, so you can actually hear the difference. So what I'm going to do going forward and, and now is um, I'm going to shoot these two and I'm going to give you guys my impression uh, of those two suppressors. Uh, I obviously can hear it. Uh, I have Jet Li or Jin behind the camera. He will also notice uh, how these, these suppressors sound. And uh, hopefully we don't have too much echo here. It's pretty open field. Um, and yeah, see see what they do. The nice thing, and that's why I'm going with more and more ruggeds, is I can just uh, screw this suppressor off, use the same adapter. So right now this is actually the Radiant adapter. It's a, I think it's the M2 adapter. It's a lighter adapter compared to the other ones. And just put the Radiant on it. So, you know, just like other quick detach, uh, systems from uh, other suppressor manufacturers you can just uh, switch back and forth so it's pretty nice once you have a few cans and a few rifles and use the same adapters you can just switch them back and forth which is um, pretty convenient anyways let's stop the talking uh, let's get to it also added the uh, holosun on here i think that's the is it a 510z or 507c i'm not really sure right now again dead brain but I needed a, a 45 degree uh, second optic on here um, just so that running gun and these kind of things, whenever we're getting closer, um, I can just use that ref reflex side for quick uh, target acquisition and don't have to worry about using the uh, two and a half base zoom thermal. All right, let's get to it. Rugged Radiant 762 going first. Great suppressor, I shot it a long time. If you guys have been watching our videos, you should be familiar with it. Um, let's take two shots, which are pretty expensive right now, but uh, let's take two shots and uh, see how it sounds.
pretty good. Nice hand warmer. Let's take this radiant off. After two shots, not too warm. Actually kind of nice because it's, it's getting a little chilly. Rugged Micro. I think it's Micro 30. I think that's the official name. Now, I'm wearing hearing protection because I haven't shot the suppressor yet. It's fairly short. I'm just expecting that uh, it's going to be significantly louder. I mean, yeah, that's why I'm wearing hearing protection. So, let's give it a try. Yes, louder. Sounds good though. I mean, I like I like the sound. I'm shooting pretty close here in, in the ground, so uh, you won't hear a lot of bullet travel and all kinds of funny acoustics with it. Um, I didn't feel uncomfortable, especially with the hearing protection. Maybe I'm gonna take one out. Maybe I'll take two out and try it again because ultimately that's that's what counts here. Let's say we would run the suppressor on a either on this Air 10, you know, run it on a 300 Blackout, for example, and I think it would be doing much better, obviously. But uh, 308, if you run it in a run and gun kind of scenario from the KM, I just want to know is the suppressor quiet enough without destroying your hearing or not. So I'm going to be the test uh, example. No, I'm going to be the test mannequin, human, whatever. I'm going to take a shot. Yeah, this wasn't bad. No ringing behind the rifle. I would be feeling comfortable shooting this, this suppressor uh, without hearing protection. Now, would I want to shoot 30 rounds with that? Maybe not. But for what we do, I mean, we don't take that many shots whenever we're out hunting. I think this is actually pretty fine. So. The only thing to consider is, let's say, you're hunting in an area where there is some some uh, population, some houses uh, here and there. Uh, obviously, we want to be as quiet as we can. We don't want to be a nuisance out here. We don't want to replace uh, one nuisance, which are feral hogs, with another nuisance, which is guys like us with a rifle. So um, I'm going to run the Radiant tonight because there are some houses around here, and I want to freak people out. So let's run the Radiant. But uh, yeah, no, this is a this is a fantastic suppressor compared to. Um, let's say the Razor or the, the Radiant, um, quieter than I anticipated, to be honest. What do you think, Chad? Lee? Um, standing more to your right, um, I can definitely feel and hear a lot more of the, the muzzle report. Um, as small and compact as that can is, it reminds me more of like a moderator than a suppressor. It, it just, you know, reduces the sound signature much more than just the raw muzzle but it's it's noticeably louder than the radiant yeah yeah as expected noticeably louder than the radiant but quieter than i thought in my opinion so it would be nice to see somebody else shoot, shoot this rifle um and uh, me standing to the side or something listening to that i also find it really interesting standing away like 50 or 100 yards from a shooter or somebody who's shooting suppressed um that has been quite surprising hearing for example micah at some point shoot his ar-10 with the uh, razor on it and I was about 100 yards away that was super quiet I mean to the point where I think if you are living maybe 400 yards away unless the wind is really you know unfortunate and you're just upwind from from that house or from from people in that area um, obviously shoot in a different direction but I don't think you would hear it I mean it's it is pretty quiet especially if you're inside or something in, in the house or whatever 